Um, uh, the agenda for today, again, we're going to be talking about WiseNet Wave uh, version 5.0. And so we're going to have a nice little introduction. And then uh, I'm going to go through this PowerPoint presentation. And this is going to give us a nice little overview and a little in depth dive into some of the new features to expect in Wave 5.0. Um, after that, that's where I'm going to jump into my VM, give you a little bit of a live demo of uh, Wave 5.0. Uh, and then if we do have time, we're going to have a little Q&A session at the end, just kind of depends on how we get and, and where we're going to end. With that being said, if you do have any questions that kind of pop up in your mind as we're going through things, please feel free to use the Q&A portion of the Zoom meeting here, uh, because if we can't get to your question, right now on the webinar. Uh, we can always pull up the transcripts of the Q&A uh, and then make sure your questions get answered um, in a timely manner here, uh, you know, a little bit after the webinar, if, if we don't have that time. Um, as stated, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, I think I mentioned that a little bit earlier. Um, and the presentation will be made available to you a little bit uh, after the webinar, either, you know, today, maybe later tomorrow uh, along those lines. Um, <clears throat> always go to, you know, the hanwasecurity.com slash training slash upcoming webinars uh, to sign up and view any of our upcoming webinars over new or existing products. Um, and of course, uh, all participants in this uh, meeting have been put into listen only mode. So if you do have uh, something you would like to say, you would like to chat with us, please use the chat feature or the Q&A feature here in Zoom. All right, WiseNet Wave version 5.0. So uh, we want to kind of get into this, start talking about what's going to be different in this product. Um, and here's going to be some of the main key features we're going to be looking at and talking about um, this morning. Um, one of the big ones is going to be two-factor authentication. Um, so Wave 5.0 is going to add the capability for two-factor authentication from the desktop uh, using a few different uh, companies that do this. And we'll, we'll see that here in just a few minutes, as stated. Um, we're going to have a new advanced object search. Um, I actually put, like I said, I put version 5 on one of my VMs this morning. I have a nice camera that's pulling a lot of uh, uh, in and out of the parking garage in the office in New Jersey. Um, so I'm going to be able to show and demo this pretty nicely um, a little bit later. So you're going to see how more of an efficient interface we have for searching through, you know, some of these AI uh, object data. Um, we will also have metadata-driven archived backups. So instead of just doing kind of bulk recorded backup, uh, we can archive based on different forms of metadata. So if you want to back up based on you know, people tracking or, you know, object, you know, people, people finding in the object search, you have that capability to, to get a little more granular with that. Um, we can do now web page proxy via the server. Um, this is going to be beneficial for, you know, different third party web interfaces that you may be putting in um, to uh, WiseNet Wave. Again, get a little deeper into that. Uh, resource grouping. Uh, so resource grouping is going to be a nice little feature that's going to allow you to add groups into your Wave server um, or, you know, uh, into your Wave desktop. So that way you can say, oh, if you want to create a group that's all of your AI cameras, you can create an AI group, put your cameras in there, uh, makes for easier navigation of the left tree. And then there's also going to be an audio mapping piece here. Um, beneficial if I want to use like an IP audio device, uh, I can now map that to a specific camera. And, and again, I'll show you this a little bit later, uh, more in the PowerPoint, but then also later in the software. <clears throat> okay, so here's kind of the first thing we're gonna talk about, some of the uh, new use features and some of the more admin functionality inside the software. So we're gonna kind of break these down a little bit. Um, so the advanced object search, as I sort of mentioned before, 
uh, you can see here now when you're doing an object search in Wave, there's going to be a brand new button that says advanced. You still have the regular search option that you have where you can type in, uh, you know, that metadata that you're searching for or some of those attributes you're searching for. But now under the advanced side, uh, you can actually bring that up and then you can say, I want to search for this object and then this classification and then this attribute of it. Um, and then, then it will show you every single one of those instances that exists. And then it will play that video all from the same player. Um, really easy, very effective uh, for quickly searching and finding um, your different objects that you're looking for uh, based on these attributes. Instead of typing in the attribute or making sure you type the search in right, you're going to have all of this data right here. Uh, Metadata-driven recording. Um, so what this is going to allow you to do, so, you know, for those of you obviously familiar with WAVE, uh, previously you had that option of, you know, record always, record motion, or record motion and low res. Um, now you'll be able to pick up based on different recording options for different metadata, not just motion. Um, so you can come in and say, well, I want to record motion plus all of my objects or I want motion objects plus low res. So again, giving you more options for how you set your cameras up to record. And then on top of that, uh, giving you a little bit better search capabilities when I'm actually pulling up the timeline and trying to pull this data in. And here you can see the color scheme is gonna be changing based on whether you're doing motion objects or motion and objects. <clears throat> uh, as mentioned earlier, that metadata-driven archive backup. Um, so when I'm coming in and setting up archival, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> archive backup inside of Wave, you can see before it was just, you know, you set those rules up and it's basically everything. Now you still have that option for what's called all archive, or you can choose one of the different following things to back up on. So you can either do motion, objects, or just video. You can do bookmarks, motion and objects, motion and bookmarks, objects and bookmarks, or motion, objects, and bookmarks. Um, so this way, you can have a backup of a wide variety of data based on uh, you know, all of the different forms of metadata that we're keeping on the wave side of things. And so instead of just doing everything, you can granularly pick uh, what little individual pieces you want to uh, back up an archive. Um, AI object detection for the event rules. Um, what this did is, it, it, in the past, you could come in and you you had that analytics object uh, there, um, but it was built straight into just the regular analytics side. You had to go analytics and then find the AI object detection, uh, and then pick one of the four for an alert in the rules engine. And now in the event rules, you can come in, instead of just picking analytics and then finding AI, you can go straight to analytic object detection. So uh, it's been given its own event inside of the event rules. Uh, again, making it easier to find, then also making it easier to come in and create rules um, based on the AI object detection. Uh, web page proxy server or via server. <clears throat> um, so really the idea is um, this is allowing you to put in um, a different website um, and then coming in and then using that as sort of a proxy server or proxy web interface between the two wave and what I'm looking for. Um, this is gonna be really useful um, when we start bringing in things like the WiseNet Road dashboard um, and some other device configuration pieces. So this way, um, I can do some forms of configuration uh, without necessarily having to have a, a wide variety of setup. So the, a question came in, this is great. Uh, we'll, we'll bring this up right quick. Um, do we integrate other manufacturers' metadata? Um, De depends necessarily on the manufacturer. Uh, you can always go to the Wave VMS website, uh, take a look at the supported camera list, and you'll, you'll get a pretty good um, 
indication of, of what kind of data and, and what sort of support integration we have uh, with third party manufacturers. Um, you know, any of those cameras that are not labeled Hanwha, what, what data we can kind of pull in. Um, usually I check that on the wavevms.com site. Good question, I appreciate it. Also, you can tell I'm in training mode and not webinar demo mode because I'm answering questions <laughs> in the middle of the presentation. Um, no, good question. I appreciate that, uh, especially because we were just talking about that data. Um, resource grouping. Uh, so again, I was playing around with version 5.0 some last week and some this morning. Um, I really like this resource grouping um, because you can just create different groups um, based on you know location or maybe based on shared feature or shared metadata. Um, and then this way, instead of just saying, oh, here's my server, and then seeing you know all of your cameras beneath the server, and then seeing you know if it's a multi-sensor having even more uh, movement on that tree, now I can come in and separate it into different groupings. Uh, and what's cool about the groupings is not only can you create them on your end, they can then be shared via the user uh, creation interface. So if you want other users to see the same resource groups you've come in and created, you can do so. Again, I'll go through and show you and walk you through this process a little bit later this morning. We'll get into Wave 5.0, and I'll show you how easy it is to create these different groups. <clears throat> audio mapping. Uh, so audio mapping is going to give you the capability to take a specific camera, and when you enable audio or two-way audio, you can use the audio specifically from the camera, or you can actually click the link that exists below those two checkboxes, um, and you can select a specific device um, that either you're going to enable the two-way audio with or even pull audio in from. Um, so you can see here where it says my example, an audio source from a camera or I.O. module with the microphone can now be used as an audio source for a different camera. Um, and you, you're going to see it's basically just going to be the same thing. You're going to click that, it's going to present you with all of the different um, models underneath it, cameras you've had added that have that audio support. You'll be able to pick one of those and then use that microphone or that module for the audio for that specific camera, um, just allowing me to do different forms of mapping. <clears throat> uh, the desktop client will now be receiving or gives the capability to turn on automatic updates. Uh, so that means uh, you can turn this on and it will download new versions of Wave Desktop. Um, and it basically will go through and update it in the background. Uh, and once it's updated, it will uh, prompt the user to restart the Wave Desktop. Once they restart Wave Desktop, it will start in that newer version. Um, this is not like this is not on by default. Um, you would come in, dependent on the specific user, you would decide whether or not you wanted this on or off. We won't necessarily look at that this morning, uh, but the web admin interface has been redesigned. Um, it's not a, a, a major, major change. Uh, but it does uh, add the capability for me to create and give permissions to different users. Uh, it also gives me a little bit more detailed information about my servers, cameras, and licenses. Um, so just really just a couple of feature additions to the web interface um, for Wave there. Uh, easy playback control. Uh, Wave has always had easy playback control. Uh, what is being done now is if you hover over the timeline, it will give you um, a little uh, display image of what was occurring at that. Also, now Wave is doing instant playback. Um, so before, think about when you were watching Wave record, you would know this. You would notice the difference between a solid green timeline and that kind of green and dark green uh, <clears throat> diagonal kind of scrolling timeline. You know that record buffer. It was about thirty seconds to a minute. 
of recording buffer. Uh, that has changed. Uh, the buffer time is now just a few seconds. Um, so you'll be able to play back video um, that occurred recently versus waiting for you know, that one minute buffer uh, to write the data to disk. Uh, improved login page. Um, so you now, if you are logged into, uh, you know, say, uh, you know, the cloud interface, you're using your Wave Sync user, you have 40 servers that you're there, uh, you can now actually go through and you can favorite different servers. Um, and you can also sort by things like favorite, you can sort by server name or IP address or a uh, different system owner or different user email. Um, so you can actually search through and sort through all of your different servers if you have a you know, sizable collection of servers there. <clears throat> uh, you do have now the capability in your uh, Wave desktop to come in and do some Windows configuration. Uh, this basically allows you to save that current state. So if you're setting up things like video walls or any sort of unattended display um, where you need to make sure Wave Desktop or Video Wall starts on the correct screen, with the correct data on it, um, you can save that Windows configuration. So the next time you bring up the client, uh, that configuration is what will be displayed and defaulted. Uh, added some new integration or new support. Um, so the desktop client will now work on Mac computers with Apple Silicon. Um, so like examples like the Apple M1 chip. Um, so increasing Apple support. Um, we have added support for the Raspberry Pi 4, uh, Mac OS 12, Windows 11, and added support for Windows Server 2022. So Wave 5 is going to increase support um, across different Apple and Windows OSs. All right, new cybersecurity measures that are gonna come in five. The big one and the first one that we're gonna talk a little bit about here. Uh, we're not gonna enable it today, but we're gonna definitely talk about it is two-factor authentication. Um, so with two-factor authentication, it's basically gonna force any user with a Cloud Sync account to have to use an authentication app. So right now, uh, Sync is gonna support Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator, or Duo Mobile to go in and verify the identity. Now, one of the things that's gonna be very important is two-factor authentication is gonna to have to be enabled on the Wave Sync account. Um, so this isn't gonna necessarily be enabled at the server level, it's gonna be enabled at the Wave Sync account. Um, where we are right now kind of giving people the heads up is um, once you enable that two-factor authentication, and you can kind of see under system administration, you know, mandatory two-factor authentication for cloud users. Um, that means any cloud users without two-factor authentication enabled will not be able to access that server anymore, of course, by design. Um, but the other thing that we're looking into and, and making sure of is that if you're a two-factor authentication uh, sync user, cloud user, but the server is not two-factor authentication, uh, what that connection stream is going to look like. Um, for those of you, if you have any access to the beta, um, we do say use two-factor authentication sparingly for right now, unless, of course, you're going through and making sure it's on, on every one of your servers. Um, but also keep in mind, you're going to require to have to have Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator, or Duo Mobile. That's going to be the important part for that two-factor authentication. So you can see here, and, and I apologize, I'm just kind of reading from the PowerPoint for this one, but um, you can see, so once that setting is used and forces all logins to use one of those uh, three authentication apps. Um, 
It's basically helping to secure access to the sync account through event password guessing, right? Or sharing your credentials. And you can see now in the web interface, when you go through and enable to thought factor authentication, it's looking at your wave sync account and it is looking to the different systems you have available. And it will show you if one of your systems is, you know, below 5.0. Um, it will tell you that it'll be inaccessible via the wave, uh, the wave client, because you've turned on two-factor authentication for your sync user, and now you have a system that doesn't support two-factor authentication. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, it will warn you if you do have any servers in your sync account that wouldn't support two-factor authentication. So you go in and look to make sure. Uh, you have all of your servers with two-factor authentication uh, before you go through and fully enable everything here. And you can see it says two-factor authentication must be enabled on the sync account and non-two-factor authentication sync users will not be able to connect uh, to that system once two-factor authentication is enabled. Uh, encrypted archive. Um, so this actually allows me to add an extra layer of security uh, on top of my recording, uh, because now I can create a password and encrypt um, encrypt all of my recorded video that's coming in. Um, this is not restricted to any specific hard drive or storage medium. Um, so if you're recording all of your data locally to independent hard drives or a rated configuration, or you are recording to a NAS or something along those lines, you're not restricted. You can use this encryption for any form of your storage medium. Uh, and whoever is the system owner would be the one who would create the encryption key. So they would be the ones who would go in and create that password um, for that specific use case. Um, and then uh, we just we have more secured connection here, um, basically going through and verifying either an SSL or SSL or TLS certificate, um, helping to avoid any sort of man in the middle attacks. Um, just trying to make Wave, you know, more secure as you're going through with these different things. This way, um, you know, Wave Wave isn't your isn't a vulnerability there. Okay. Uh, just a, a couple new sort of uh, improved device integration pieces. Um, for the PTZs, um, we are offering a wiper, spin, and a heated trigger inside of the software. So these will be soft trigger buttons that can be created um, or utilized for pan tilt zoom cameras that have you know the wiper, spin, or uh, heater functionality. Um, the TID 600R, um, we're creating a button pop-up rule for this. Um, this is, you know, one of the, uh, the intercom pieces that's going to have integration in 5.0 with the button pop-up rule. Um, we're going to be able to do PTRZ and verifocal lens control from the live UI. Um, so this way, instead of having to go into the camera interface to do uh, pan, tilt, rotate, and zoom functionality, you'll be able to do that from the live UI interface, uh, similar to like PTZ controls now, just of course, for PTRZ. Um, you'll be able to do manual auto tracking, uh, doing an alt and click option inside of Wave 5.0. Um, you'll be able to do SD card event rules. Um, so they're gonna add uh, some more SD card functionality for the event rules engine. Um, WiseNet Road AI integration will be showing up in 5.0. Uh, there will also be integration for the SPC2000. Um, there's going to be improved performance for the ultra high resolution, so like the 8K cameras, uh, and also increased performance for very high FPS performance. Um, so these are going to be things like your over 30 frames a second options. Um, so these are just going to be kind of more of some of the device integration or uh, device feature sets that are going to be added in uh, in the software here in five. Uh, and the release date, 
Um, the expected release date for WiseNet 5.0 is going to be the end of this month. So the end of June 2022. Um, the other thing to point out about this, uh, this may not show up as an automatic update for a few weeks after release. So you might be able to come and download it by the end of June 2022, uh, but um, you may not get any of the automatic updates until you know, middle of July or a little bit later, later than that. <clears throat> All right. And then the, the last thing we're going to talk about here on the little PowerPoint side is how you're going to get 5.0. Um, once released, it's going to show up on wavevms.com. Um, it's going to be a pretty simple installation like the others. You're going to run the installer on an existing system. It's going to perform the update. Uh, you'll also be able to go in to the system administration and update and type in the build number password and do the upgrade that way. Uh, or you can always wait for the release to be pushed to the update server. Um, if you have like those automatic updates at the system done, you can always go through that route. Um, note, uh, with 5.0, you don't have to worry about different jumps in version or things like that, or having to go through and make sure different things are set before you upgrade it. Uh, it's gonna be a simple, just run the installer and go. All right. I like this exclamation point here that says demo time. Okay, get out of the PowerPoint presentation here. Uh, and I'm going to jump over to my VM that I have going up. We're going to talk about a few of the things here that we just showed. I'm going to show you where some of that stuff exists. You know, also, you know, walk you through some of the other data. Um, so first things first, um, I'm, let's talk about some of the AI options here. Now, you know, first thing, of, you know, what you can see here is 5.0, not major changes in the UI. So, um, you know, you're used to, to running your version fours. It's, you're not gonna, you're not gonna go, you know, and download this and install and be like, I have no idea what I'm doing anymore. Um, same, same kind of control scheme. Uh, same control interface here. Uh, this was those added features we talked about. So uh, first thing I'll jump into, and we'll be able to see this, is those recording options we were talking about. So uh, now when you go into recording, you're still going to see the same thing you're familiar with. Record always, motion only, motion plus, low res. Same thing as you've seen previous versions. But now, and this is going to be big for, you know, obviously some of the AI function cameras, but I can do object recording. So I can say, I just want to record objects only. So if this is an AI camera and you're watching a parking garage, you could say only record data when I'm getting that object. And I can add, you know, let's do, you know, 10 seconds before, 10 seconds after. And I can still do pre-motion or uh, pre-object recording. You can see that here. Uh, you also have the capability to piggyback motion and objects all together and do the same thing you've done in the past. So I can have motion objects plus record always at the low resolution stream. Um, so I think I actually set one of my AI cameras up that way this morning. Oh, I, I guess I, I thought I did. I guess I didn't, my bad. Um, but you can see here, I can come in and say, I wanna do motion objects plus low res. So now when I'm looking later here at my recorded history, um, I will see different separation based on motion, based on object, uh, or just my usual record always at low resolution. So just changing that metadata piece there. <clears throat> All right. I'm gonna bring up one of the AI cameras. So like I said, I have an AI camera that's nicely pointed uh, at the parking garage. Uh, so I can come in and go in to my object search. You can see the icons changed a little bit. Uh, looks like a person with kind of a box around them. And you can see my different object detection. So this, this part here hasn't changed. Same as before, shows you the best shot image. Uh, shows you some basic attributes for it as well. But now, 
you have a new button in five that shows up as advanced. I can click the advanced button and it will take you to the advanced object search piece here. Again, it shows me my different data. Well, by default, it shows me with nothing connected, but <clears throat> so it's gonna show me all of my different object detection and some of my attributes for it. But now when I come in and do my search, instead of say doing like a typing in and typing in then that search right here, I could say, well, show me face. You know, I can pick gender, I can pick age, if there's a hat, mask or glasses. And obviously this camera hasn't seen any people, but I can just do kind of a, a, a selection here for any of my different attributes and then search through my AI data. So I'm gonna pick vehicle because I know there's been vehicles. And so I can say, oh, here's vehicle. Uh, let me pick car. I wanna see all the cars that were blue that have driven by since this morning. And so now it shows me in a little thumbnail view over here <clears throat> when I click on it, the recorded history for that object coming across. It shows me what object was detected, what camera I'm on, and then what was that timestamp? I can toggle this to repeat it if I would like, you know, playback, fast forward, reverse. If you double click it in this object window, it will take that recording to the full screen behind it. Um, so that's what happens when I double click it. But if you also notice, it's now separating with a yellow bar on my timeline all of these events that show up with that specific attribute that I'm searching for. So when I go and search for a green car, I have a lot less green cars. You can tell now on my timeline, I have a lot less AI uh, functionalities popping up. So it just gives you this really nice interface to search through the attributes. You could still, of course, use the search criteria here and you know, say, you know, vehicle, car and then you know, designate a color if you would like, uh, or you can always use the advanced options as well to search based on the specific attributes with having, without having to type in those different attributes that you may be looking for. <clears throat> so that's the AI advanced feature. Um, building on with that, just because we're talking AI, in the camera rules side of things, when creating a new rule with an AI camera, I can come in and now you have analytic events like you had before, but what is not under analytic events anymore, if I, my camera, the, and I picked a lot of cameras, um, <laughs> the uh, AI has been removed from the analytic side of it. If you wanna do like object detection or some of the AI function, you'll now select analytics object detected. You'll then be able to pick the specific camera. And then pick what object you want, face, license plate, or person. And then it separates the vehicles into the four classifications of vehicles of bike, bus, car, or truck. So I can say, alert me when a car is detected on this specific camera. And then of course, go through your normal rules engine and do your specific uh, action. All right. Okay. Don't need that rule. Um, I already created one this morning, but I'll create a new one. So you can see here under my left tree, I now have a group. So I can either pick a one camera, right click on it and say create group, or if I wanted, I could highlight multiple devices, right click. Create group, give it a name. And so now if you'll see, it took those cameras out of my like generic left tree because now it put them under the group that I just created called parking garage. And so I can see those cameras underneath it and I can come in with my left tree with as many of these different groups as I see fit. And so now I can have multiple different groupings. And so I have a, a, a more granular structured left tree um, where I can come in 
find those individual objects or find those individual cameras based on the different group, groupings they exist as. And if you need, if I, I miscategorize this, I can always left click and drag it and drop it to a different group. And if you want to remove a group completely, um, you just right click it and remove group. Um, and that will take it away. And then you can come in, of course, and recreate it <clears throat> as necessary. Um, and now, since we're talking about groups, when I come in and I do user creation and I do role creation, if they're shared resources, you can come in and see where I can give permissions to cameras and resources. The groups and the cameras individually show up so that I can give access to a specific group, or I can still give access to individual granular cameras, uh, depending on kind of how you want to handle that. Uh, you know what, that's a great question. I did answer that one. Um, question came in and, and like I said, I, I guess you can't take the training out of me. Um, can a camera be in multiple groups? Uh, so right now, as you can kind of tell, as I'm moving the cameras around, cameras are specifically in a group as I move or add them. And I clicked and dragged that poorly, I apologize. So you notice as I move it, it moves to a different group, indicating that that camera can only be part of one specific group. So good, good question on those groupings. So a camera is, yes, just one group per camera. Um, and then, so yeah, like I showed, you can also give user permissions for those individual pieces. All right, just a few more things I do wanna, uh, to kind of get into and show. Actually, I'll show this next. Uh, the backup data. So now, uh, first off, backup has been moved. Uh, backup used to be under the storage management portion. Um, that's been moved to its own section called backup. Now, I don't. I only have the single drive, uh, but this is where I would come in and, and do that backup capability. And as we talked about before, uh, I can backup based on specific objects or metadata instead of just doing a one broad everything backup uh, and archive. So. You always have that capability. All right. Uh, you can also see, uh, just in general, just, just from a kind of UI standpoint, uh, things like system administration, you can see uh, they've sort of changed the order with which um, the different options in uh, system administration show up. Uh, there's also a brand new tab called security. Uh, so this is going to be obviously where a lot of the things that you would think of that are going to be for the security of the WAVE system are going to show up. So this is now where um, I can enable HTTPS. I can encrypt my live video traffic to mobile clients. And this is also where I would enable my recorded history um, overlay. Now, these, these, of course, existed in you know, previous iterations before 5.0, but now they're all in one specific location in the security portion of system administration, whereas before they were all under the general tab um, under that data protection option. Um, same user activity as we've seen before, again, just in the security window. The, the new option here that we talked about earlier, this is where I come in and I opt for encryption. So it says, obviously, the encryption password will be required to restore the archive on another system. Uh, the password cannot be reset. If you lose it, the archive will be unrecoverable. A very important uh, warning message to you there when you enable encryption. Uh, you can still hit cancel and back out of this. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, when you're talking about this feature, uh, if someone enables it, if they forget their password a year later, uh, that's going to be problematic. Um, that means basically that video will be unrecoverable for archive purposes. Um, so this kind of goes hand in hand uh, with my backup management. Okay. 
see that data there. And then the last thing I'll bring up, I'm going to jump into that server web page. It doesn't matter which password I use here. It shouldn't. Um, so you can see it's connected to Wave Sync. This is what I wanted to show you here uh, is where you're going to see things, uh, encrypt video traffic. Um, also, this is where I would come in and have that capability to set up <clears throat> two-factor authentication um, if I had that enabled. Now, I haven't gone into WaveSync yet to enable it on my side, um, so I wouldn't see it specifically on this side either. So uh, this is where you would see that data if I was also logged into WaveSync. Okay, give me just a little second here. I'm going to cheat just a little bit. Make sure. Ah, yeah, I did forget one, and it's an important one. I apologize. <clears throat> Last thing we'll end with here on the demo side, and then we can open up for, for questions. I, I'll definitely have a few minutes to, to see if there's anything coming in. Under the general tab of your uh, camera settings, you have this capability, of course, to enable audio and two-way audio from here. But by default, if you notice, mine says use audio stream from this camera. So I have a PND-A9081. I enabled audio. I'm going to use whatever audio is enabled at that specific camera. This is where I have the capability, however, to come in and say, no, I would like to use an audio stream from another camera. And then it's going to allow me to come in and pick and it's going to show me the different objects that I can pull from here. So I can be like, oh, no, no, no. I want to use the microphone from the 8082 here to be my audio stream for this specific camera. Um, <clears throat> so then I can also come in and do the same thing for two-way audio if I have uh, a different device that I can select for that. And so, of course, apply it and OK it. I can also come in and do that multiple times. So um, here we go. I can have that same camera. So that X and D A two. I selected that for the other one. I can have that be the driving audio. So that could be the the microphone for these two other cameras that I've just selected. So um, you're not restricted here. I can pick one camera that's recording audio and I can have that be the audio database or the audio or leading the audio for multiple of my different cameras there at a time. All right. So uh, like I said, I want to get through that PowerPoint. I want to show you some of these new features in Wave 5.0. So I want to kind of show you what it's going to look like in the client um, and show you some of those cool things there. Um, now, I do have a few more minutes uh, to stay logged in. Um, so if anybody has any, any questions, please, you know, go ahead and, and hit us up in the chat or the QA portion. Um, we'll go through and I can answer a few of them. Um, and I'm, I'm going to stand for a few more minutes. And then I do, unfortunately, have to drop off uh, for a training session that Greg's giving, but I'm working back up for. Um, so I'm going to stay here for a few minutes. If you have any questions, please uh, don't, you know, don't hesitate. Let us know what's going on. Um, I definitely appreciate your time this morning. Uh, also, thanks for, for, for sticking with us. Uh, I know everyone's, everyone's used to Aaron and, and loves Aaron. Um, it's hard not to, right? Uh, but uh, thank you for sticking with me this morning um, as we, uh, we kind of change things around. Awesome, I appreciate that. Now, thank you very much for joining us uh, this morning or afternoon, uh, wherever you may be. And we definitely appreciate the time uh, you give us. Thanks.
see something coming in here in the chat. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Saw someone raise their hand. Uh, good question. Uh, so the question was, are the intrusion events added to the timeline or is it, is it just objects? Um, so for right now, uh, as it stands in 5.0, it's just going to be those objects um, because that's going to be my other, you know, recorded marker here that I can add in addition to motion. Um, not necessarily other metadata uh, that's happening. Um, now, with that being said, to kind of give you a workaround for it, at least in the interim, I don't know if that's going to change or not, but uh, you would be able to have the capability to still use intrusion in the event rules. So I could pick a camera and say, I'm going to do an intrusion event. And then what I would do in that scenario, and again, maybe not, exa you know, not exactly maybe what you're looking for, but I can say when that intrusion occurs, a bookmark my recorded history for that specific uh, camera. And then so I can put those different tags in to say like intrusion or what have you. Um, so that way I would still see some indication on my timeline. It's just not, you know, like what you're going to see with the different object detection or the motion detection currently. Good question. I, I definitely appreciate that. <clears throat> All right, everyone. Um, I, I, I do apologize. I do got to go and run to another webinar. Uh, I need to, to help Greg out on this training class. Um, we have a full group today, uh, but, you know, if anybody has any questions, you know, that you don't think of right now, but you think of a little bit later, you know, don't hesitate to send uh, Greg, Aaron, or myself an email. Uh, you know, we can definitely take a look and, and sort of help you out if you have any other questions. Also, um, like I said, this is being recorded. Uh, we will definitely send this out a link to this uh, when we are ready to share it so uh, thanks again everybody definitely appreciate your time um i look forward uh, to talking to you all in the future it's been many years since i've given any form of demo and i kind of liked it so maybe aaron will let me do more of <laughs> uh, thanks everybody have a really great rest of your day uh, and a really great week and we will talk to everybody later.